Hello, welcome back. In this video, we'll review over assigning oxidation states um, based on what you would have learned in first semester drill and chemistry. But it's really important that we have a good understanding um, of assigning oxidation states before we move forward to balancing redox reactions in acidic or basic solution. It's important to recognize, is a substance being oxidized? Is it being reduced? So we just learned in the previous video that redox reactions create the flow of electric charge. And we saw applications such as how lightning works, batteries, and cellular respiration. Um, so now we're going to discuss on a chemical level, like how this happens, like how are these electrons like transferred, right, from what species to what. And so there's rules to assigning these oxidation states. And these rules are hierarchical. So let me highlight that. That's really important. And if any two rules conflict, follow the rule that is higher on the list. So the first rule is that the oxidation state of an atom in a free element is zero. So for example, chlorine is one of the diatomic uh, molecules on the periodic table. It's in its natural form, and so it's assigned a zero oxidation state. So is copper metal. Um, now the oxidation state of a monoatomic ion is equal to its charge. So for example, calcium we know has a plus two charge, and so we would assign that a plus two oxidation state. Chlorine has a negative one charge, so a negative one oxidation state. Now number three is really important. The sum of the oxidation states of all atoms in a neutral molecule or formula unit is zero. So for example, all the oxidation states in water must add up to zero. And so for example, hydrogen will be plus one, so two times plus one is two. Oxygen is negative two, so plus two minus two is zero. An ion that is equal to a charge of the ion. So for example, there are the polyatomic ions like nitrate. And so all the oxidation states need to add up to a negative one. Now in their compounds, metals have positive oxidation states. So for example, group 1A metals always have an oxidation state of plus one. Group 2A metals always have an oxidation state of plus two. Then you look at the nonmetals. We assign nonmetals oxidation states according to the table on the next page. And then entries at the top, once again, hierarchical, um, on top of the table take precedence over entries at the bottom. So you can see here, fluorine is going to have a negative one oxidation state. Hydrogen, plus one. Oxygen, negative two. Group 7A, negative one. Group 6A, negative two. Group 5A, negative three. As a side note here, and then like anything else, by the way, before I say that, anything else that wasn't listed on this table just needs to be figured out such that rule number three is followed, right? So you just work backwards such that the rule number three follows. So if it's a neutral molecule, you need to figure out, oh, what does this element must be? So everything adds up to zero. And you'll see that when we work examples. And then um, also oxidation states are not ionic charge. Ionic charge is real. <laughs> it's a real property of the ion but the oxidation state of an atom is just theoretical, but it's like electron bookkeeping. It's really useful for us to quickly identify if a substance being oxidized or reduced. <clears throat> so the oxidation state of any given element generally depends on what other elements are present in the compound. The exceptions are the group 1A and 2A metals, which are always plus one and plus two respectively. Rule three must always be followed. Therefore, when following the hi hierarchy shown in rule five, we give priority to elements highest on the list and then assign the oxidation state of the element lowest on the list using rule three. So it like adds up to a zero if it's neutral, adds up to the charge if it's got an overall charge. 
And like I said, when assigning oxidation states to elements that are not covered by rules four and five, such as carbon, we use rule three to deduce their oxidation state. So we essentially work backwards once all other oxidation states have been assigned. So I know that's a lot of rules and I do not believe it's in your best interest to sit down and try to memorize all this. It really just takes practice, right? Practicing problems um, so that you recognize those patterns and then the rules become second nature. It's like learning vocabulary for learning a new language, right? We just gotta develop it, we gotta practice it, we gotta use it so it becomes second nature, okay? So, and hopefully you've already done so because this is a topic that is covered in first semester general chemistry, but I wanted to review it just in case um, you forgot anything. Um, but let's do an example. Let's say we have hydrogen gas plus chlorine gas to make hydrogen chloride gas. Okay. And we want to assign oxidation states. Well, hydrogen gas and chlorine gas are actually in their most natural elemental form. They're diatomic gases. And so we would assign them an oxidation state of zero. So because they're in their like free element form. So I always like to write oxidation states directly above in a different colored pen so that I don't confuse it with any charges or anything. So that's something I would suggest for you to do. All right. Um, then it looks like we have a hydrogen and a chlorine, but overall the hydrogen chloride needs to add up to zero. So we need to obey rule number three always, right? But I see here hydrogen is plus one. There are exceptions to that rule. You may have learned about hydrides, um, which hydrogen has a negative one, but do not worry about that for my particular class. Although you'll run into hydrides um, when you work in organic chemistry, if that's something that you're pursuing. So sodium hydride, lithium aluminum hydride, sodium borohydride, like those are very common um, reducing agents. All right, so let's go ahead and write a little positive one above hydrogen and chlorines in group 7A. It's negative one, it has to be negative one anyways so that everything adds up to zero. Plus one, negative one equals zero. All right, the next thing you wanna do is separate out the half reactions. And so I always take one of the reactants and then I look on the product side and see what looks um, very similar, like a sibling of that reactant. And it helps that we only have one product, but in a lot of cases you'll have another product. And so, like I said, you always wanna pick out siblings whenever you're finding a half reaction. And you'll, you'll see that as we work more problems together in the future. So the first half reaction I'm gonna write is hydrogen gas to produce hydrogen chloride. And I will only write the oxidation states for the hydrogen because I wanna see how hydrogen changes. Now I noticed that hydrogen gets more positive, right? To get more positive, does that mean hydrogen had to gain electrons or lose electrons? And remember, electrons have a negative charge. Excellent, so he had to lose electrons. So I, you take into account the stoichiometric coefficient, so it had to lose two electrons and when you lose electrons, you put them on the product side, right? Because they left from the original starting material, okay? Another way to know like, okay, how many electrons do I add into which side? It's like I said, you look at the oxidation state. There were two of them, so that would be like a positive two charge. So to balance that out, you need a negative two. So both sides are essentially equal, um, zero and zero in this case here. So if we lost electrons, we think about our mnemonic device, oil rig. And so what process is taking place? Oxidation or reduction? Excellent. Oxidation is a loss of electrons. Very good. And then we know it must mean reduction for the other one, but we'll just write it out and derive it so that you can follow along. So chlorine 
would be the other half reaction. Zero over here, if it went negative one over here, now it became more negative. So if it becomes more negative, that means it needs to gain more electrons. So here it gained two electrons. And remember, redox reactions go hand in hand. You can't have reduction without oxidation, right? So these electrons lost are transferred over here so that chlorine can gain them and undergoes reduction. Reduction is a gain of electrons. Okay. All right. In addition to identify if it's oxidation or reduction, we also want to identify what is our oxidizing, oxidizing agent or our reducing agent. So because hydrogen is undergoing oxidation, it is the reducing agent. It's always opposite. So hydrogen gas is the reducing agent. Now, the way I remember this is first, I just know that they're opposite of each other. So it's easier for me to realize like, oh, it's undergoing oxidation. So it's a reducing agent. But in addition, agent means to help, right? Like it's like kind of aiding the other half reaction to do its job, right? So hydrogen had to lose these two electrons so that chlorine could be reduced. And so that's why it's the reducing agent because it's helping the reduction take place. Therefore, chlorine must be the oxidizing agent, right? It's opposite, and it's helping hydrogen undergo oxidation, right? They're helping one another. They go hand in hand there. All right, so make sure you go over these rules, you feel comfortable with them again. Quickly being able to identify oxidation states will be useful for you when we balance redox reactions in acidic and basic solutions. Um, so yeah, thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time.